Well, let's start with the company. EQT is relatively fresh. Do you okay? EQT is relatively fresh to real estate. We started that venture three years ago um, and then relatively quickly ramped up you know, the real estate platform with the help of the big EQT umbrella. EQT is a massive private equity franchise that hadn't done real estate. It was founded um, in, the, in the early 90s, focusing on industrial private equity, you know, long-term management of industrial companies. Uh, in 2015, we started real estate um, and, and hence benefited massively from the, from, you know, from the big industrial advisor committee, from the contacts that EQT already had in Germany, um, and managed to buy a few interesting things. The focus is always on, you know, buying something that fundamentally has what we call good bones, and then grow that from there. You know, don't stray too far away from the trodden path, but do something that other people might not have the time for, you know, be willing to take the risk of converting. So that's, that's the basic premise. I've personally started in, in real estate in, uh, well, I guess 2003 at Blackstone. Uh, before that, I was in the structured finance group at JP Morgan doing real estate financings as well, but, but real estate since then, which means, you know, two and a half cycles or so of, of real estate. Great. Tim. Yeah, we are probably the complete opposite. Um, we are part of the Swiss Life Asset Managers. It's a Swiss uh, insurance company, Swiss Life. We mm -hmm. own the assets um, sometimes for more than 100 years. At least that's uh, not only the marketing message. We really have properties in Switzerland that we own that law. In uh, Germany, we have around 15 billion under management. In Europe, it's more than 60. Um, the difference to other insurance companies is probably that we are also doing um, developments in residential. We do developments also commercial and uh, we work for the group and for the partners. Um, I'm in real estate maybe at the same time as, as you. I was in HSBC in London in the investment banking with Rothschilds uh, for a few years and now for five years it's called. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks for um, the, the kind words uh, in the beginning, Richard, and welcome to our new headquarter here. Um, Oliver Kummerfeld, I work for Schroeder Real Estate. Um, we are part of this massive, massive company, one of the biggest listed um, asset managers. Um, we do real estate, we do direct real estate, um, we do indirect real estate. Um, I'm myself in the research team, uh, focusing on continental Europe, so uh, that's mostly, mostly Western Europe. My job really is to sort of um, steer the investment strategy, um, help the fund and asset managers on a day-to-day on -day basis when it comes to uh, decision making, do a bit of um, market um, monitoring and really guide us um, through the process of um, in investing in Europe. Um, I've worked for 10 years in, in the brokerage business where um, I've been um, doing um, research for the whole EMEA region. Um, and um, I um, sort of, uh, moved to Shorters about um, four years ago. Germany, obviously, very interesting for us, very big market in, in Europe, and a lot of capital that we see at the moment and which we're managing for our clients is in, uh, in Germany. Great. Nice. Uh, my name is Marius Preising. I'm, uh, uh, I'm a managing part of INS Swiss AG, which is part of the INS group. Uh, it's headquartered in Berlin, so we are a real estate investment manager, as I said, Berlin based. We have a very strong team also in Frankfurt. Um, I think we do all the asset management in-house from our investments, which are primarily focusing on, on Germany. Uh, we, do, uh, we do have an office fund running. Uh, at the same time, we do club deals, uh, which is focusing again all over Germany. But uh, when we talk about residential, we mainly look at Berlin, so which I think is the topic of today. Um, I've been in the industry for about 10 years. I used to be with Corsair Capital before. Uh, always on the client relations side, that's also my part here at NAS. Great. Thomas, you can go, but you didn't say much about Catella, so I'll give, you, I'll give you one minute here. <laughs> okay, Catella actually is a Swedish based investment company run by Rick Rick. It's a liaison, and um, it was established as a company, it was a con 600 employees, uh, advisory service, uh, asset management, development, banking in Luxembourg. That's fine, that's good. Okay, good. And all of them are blonde, by the way. No <laughs> serious. Um, let's, let, let's, let's start with you, Ollie, if we can. Um, <coughs> let's pick up on some of the, some of the economic parts. Um, so, economy performing well, there's growth. Um, how do you see the outlook short and medium term? What's, what's your sense of that, given that you're in your position as an analyst? Yeah. 
Look, I mean, I think Germany, um, and as, as Thomas rightly indicated, you know, had a very good run. Uh, I think, you know, for, for 10 years, you know, we've seen um, solid growth coming through, and especially sort of uh, 2016, 17, 18 were years where we really saw sort of growth about 2% in GDP, fantastic. Now look, it's gonna, the economic momentum will sort of vanish a little bit. I mean, if you look at the forecast, most of the forecasts over the year have been downgraded slightly. Um, and you see a lot of headlines going like, oh God, the momentum is vanishing. But again, if you look at the forecast for 2019, two, yeah, for 2018, 2019, we're still gonna be coming in at 1.8, 1.7%, which is still above trend. And I think it's, it's no reason for concern. The majority of, of that is driven by uh, sort of slower uh, world trade, a um, little bit of, of high oil prices. And again, you know, the economy has been firing out of all cylinders. You know, unemployment is as low as it's probably never been. So companies really struggle to find enough sort of skilled labor uh, to expand further, you know. Um, so I think at that point, it's, it's not a concern. Uh, it's not really uh, a surprise that economic momentum is, is going to sort of drop a little bit. But again, you know, 1.7% is nothing, nothing to worry about. We've seen, we've seen way worse times. Okay, good. Um, and Tim, just picking up that that with you. Um, I mean, normally, if something you know, if, if a country has solid economic fundamentals, that also then influences um, how the different sectors are working. Traditionally, good for retail, uh, occupancy rates in office. Um, what's your sense of how the, the current kind of economic fundamentals are influencing the real estate markets that you're active in? Well, we do all asset classes, really, from from healthcare or the residential to to any kind of. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put this on and pass that to yeah. you, Tim. Just to, to, to any commercial yeah. <laughs> sector. That's how it. Um, I guess while you said that the economic fundamentals should push the retail sector, um, we see that in shopping centers it's getting more difficult because the concept's probably partly outdated. We need more. We need a lot of refurbishments, I guess, of shopping centers. Um, we have, um, in the high streets, we have very high prices, but we have lots of concepts that struggle. We see H&M with difficult times, but we, s we still um, run for their contracts. And I'm, well, I'm not convinced that high street investments in every, um, in every city are the right investments. Um, where we are still active in, in retail is um, kind of the boring food retail anchored out of town small Fachmarktzentrum centrum because at least in the regional areas we see very limited competition by online um, and because of a lack of new building permits we see also a lack of um, additional competition. Okay, good. And, uh, and Frank, obviously you're working in, in different areas. How do you see that? Do you see it as, as positive for you? Is that giving you opportunities that maybe you weren't seeing before in terms of the, the fundamentals? Well, the fun fundamentals are as good as they can. <coughs> the interest rate is as low as it ever was, and then people get very used to that. So, so that makes it difficult for somebody who needs to be, make mid-teens returns. Let's, for, let's for, use that as well. Is it difficult to hear at the back? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so <coughs> that, we'll use this. So the current environment makes it very difficult for somebody who's supposed to make mid-teens returns for the LPs in a private equity fund to find product that, that logically just produces that on a call it on a spreadsheet, on a piece of paper, if you, if you run your numbers, without assuming any crazy growth, which is what happened in 2006, 2007, people were just, yeah, it's kind of We kind of refuse to, to take that perspective and really are looking for, you know, what can I buy that somebody else has missed in his analysis, or, or you know, where I, where I have skills that I can employ through the franchise that we have to, to make something better out of it. Uh, the most recent asset, just to talk quickly about something that we've done, was a shopping center that we bought in Leipzig. And the reason that we bought a shopping center in Leipzig Grünau wasn't that it was a shopping center. We think shop shopping centers are awesome. Because I do think there are some, some fundamental headwinds in the way that shopping centers were devised in the 80s and 90s to, to what the market needs today and how much you know retail area is needed in any given relevant asset today. So this asset, as much as all the others, I think has too many square meters of sales area. But Leipzig's wrong. So all of a sudden, you can say, well, how can I get exposure to, some, to a market that had population growth of you know, 13, 14% in the last five years? 
you know, where, where housing gets scarce, where people are moving their companies from Berlin to Leipzig because Berlin's getting too expensive in Leipzig. You know, a well-educated population uh, has a bunch of, you know, relevant infrastructure, well-connected, and it's quite central in Germany. So, so just trying to find angles, how, I, how we can reason uh, business cases today still exists, and there's still markets like this. Uh, you know, in the big seven, Leipzig doesn't show up, but really, you know, it should be the big nine. Leipzig and Dresden belong in there. So, so, it's, um, so, so it's that sort of logic that we have Okay, good. Um, and do you want to pick that up, uh, Maris, just in terms of, of, of what you are saying? No, f fully agree with, uh, with respect to, to uh, capabilities. And I mean, we also look in-house and I think we've got a very strong asset management team uh, in place. So in that sense, uh, we also look at assets where there's a certain amount of asset management work to be done. Uh, for example, also we go a bit outside of, of the big cities in, in, some, in some extent. So we bought in Munich Airport, for example. We bought in some cities which you saw in there, in, uh, like Dortmund. Um, and, and there's always there's, there's a good case w with some of the assets we have purchased, so we were lucky, uh, given that, I mean, in terms of some vacancy reduction, which we could implement. So there's still, there's still value to, to, be, to be increased in, in some of these assets, but we all fully agree, I think, like prices in, in the big cities and also in, in booming towns like Leipzig, they're on a very high level. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, in the end, it comes a lot down to how you look at the asset uh, compared to your competitors. Yeah. But I think it's, it is important in, in, to a certain extent to have a, a good team uh, which, is, which is executing those business plans because we are, yeah, we are on a level, uh, as we all know, there's little mistakes which, which you can do. Okay, good. Yeah, Oli, pick that up. If you're Richard, um, in terms of, of retail, I think you know there's there's two things we need to distinguish. One of them is um, sort of the the fundamentals in terms of population growth, demographics, because you see this trend uh, in in Germany. You have regions and cities which you know grow fantastically, and other regions you know which actually lose population. So that is something you need to always consider when it comes to retail. And the other one is format, and you already mentioned it. You know. Um, you said, you know, all oh, these boring grocery anchored formats. I think, you know, it's not boring. I think that's actually uh, something that is very interesting, um, especially retail warehousing. You have a big grocery anchor and you have all the sort of uh, other shops around and um, investors have been picking up on that because you, you see the investment volumes for retail warehouses in Germany, you know, it's only one way and, and that's up. Shopping centers, um, I think again, you need to distinguish, you know, there are the, the big malls, the fancy malls, um, which have Comparably, have been comparably well maintained, and I think they still work. Where I think one of the reasons, one of the things you picked up on is, is really sort of these malls in mid-tier markets where where you really need to be a good asset manager to make sure you keep the center vital, you keep the people coming in. Because funnily enough, while retail sales in Germany are growing, I mean at an unemployment rate of four percent and more people in jobs and wages going up, retail sales are growing, but a lot of it is happening online. So you know the the store like for like sales you know are almost flat. Um, so re retail again you know you need to distinguish between the fundamentals, pick the right location, then you need to pick the right uh, format as well. I think high street still still very interesting um, area, but again massive competition, and you can see that retailers want to be uh, in the, in the high streets because they need that for their branding. Um, you know you want to walk down the high street and see the shirt at a certain shop. Um, but I think what we notice is that a lot of these retailers are can, looking very carefully at how much space they have, and they would actually often come to you and say, like, look, we'll be happy to stay, but we want to reduce a little bit our footprint. Or they say, like, look, you know, rents in retail high streets have been going up and up and up throughout, the, even through the crisis. And they say, like, look, this is a level now where you know we we are inclined not to pay, not to pay more. You wanted to pick that up, Tom? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think, uh, especially on the retail sector, we are we are not as optimistic as it seems from a broader view, of course, because uh, we think that not everybody will understand what e-commerce really means. So uh, we expect a huge shake-up, like like UK the last about ten years. So make an evolution in that. So Germans are far, far, far behind uh, ahead of that. First comment. Second thing, from a tactical thing, as a management means not replace, because fashion is vanishing by a burger shop. <laughs> Have a look on the lease contract and you see what I mean. So the again sounds a little bit provocative, but uh, typical situation is that uh, especially with ten years old shopping centers, we see all these super uh, relaxing areas with burgers, burgers and noodles and whatever. I like by the way, but if you look on the contract, I missed forty percent. 
of income stream. And this is again on the first view, perfect, no doubt, a lot of chances within these terminal. But uh, I think we should get a little bit more smarter on that thing, whatever this means, what is retail. And so the mixed use philosophy or the campus mixed use, the shopping, resi, and, and maybe office, or we work in one building. This is which I run more for from a strategic um, um, approach rather than just picking out um, fashion and replace it to the boroughs. Simple story. Okay, so from your point of view, you're saying you, you think the future is mixed use, yeah. that that's where there's going to be most of the retail. <coughs> Does anybody share that view, or do we? Well, picture by the way. By the way, what, what is retail? It's just probably the total, but uh, of course, with the Fachmann Center and all these, they, they are they identified profiles, no doubt, but the big pet shopping centers, they will come massive under pressure. Definitely. And the interesting was because you picked it up with gastronomy. Um, you know, a fashion brand might be around for like five, six, or ten years. If you look in gastronomy, you know, the consumers want something new every day. Um, so you either have someone um, who takes out still sort of a five or ten year lease, but then sort of changes the, you know, just uh, the concept every three years or so. Or if you are really unfortunate, you know, you have someone who's going to sign a five year lease, but after three years, they run out of steam because the consumer is, is not interested in that sort of format anymore. So yeah, yeah it, is, it is definitely challenging. Too much burgers on the market. Too much, too much burger shops. <laughs> Whereas I quite like to have the same thing every day, so maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, good. Let's let's have a little bit look at office. You mentioned there um, we work. Um, Tim, maybe coming to you, just in terms of the office sector, what are you seeing? We we just mentioned we work there, but also, you know, very high um, employment rates. Um, does that mean that office take up is going to increase? Where are we with pipelines of development? Um, what, what's your what's your sense of that, and, and I guess what does that then mean for rents? Okay, that's a lot of questions. Um, it certainly is. Well, <laughs> first thing I start with something different. Um, so I guess five years or so, five years ago, we decided to not do single tenants or only do single tenants if they are super strong and the the rental contracts and the locations of the properties are really good. Um, and these. This year, it becomes really difficult to stick to your own rules, and that is something that we discuss in our organization every day, that we need to spread the default risk of our tenants and maintain the, the braveness to, to um, stick to our multi-tenant strategy. And if you look to our portfolios where we have executed the strategy, the portfolios uh, perform quite good. And um, we see the one tenant go, and we see another tenant coming, and now coming more to your questions, um, we see, of course, a support by the economic fundamentals that uh, rents increase, and that even if the rental contracts become um, shorter, at least over the last three to five years, it was a net positive for us because we could decrease rents. Um, personally, I believe the cycle will come to an end at some point, and the question is obviously when, and at that point of time, we obviously want to have long rental contracts. And at the moment, if we have the chance to extend contracts, we start extending contracts. And because we think, well, the market may go on for two years, may go on for three years, um, but if we have now the chance to get a five-year-plus contract by a proper tenant, we <coughs> take the contract. But we don't probably take it from the burger shop because it's worthless. You don't need a, a ten-year contract from a burger shop because they will not uh, execute it. Um, then the other part of the questions, do I think that uh, tenant demand will increase further? Um, personally, I believe in, in Germany we have a lot of space per um, employee, per office employee. And if I look to London and I look to all the co-working concept, I think in the next 10, 20 years, the space per employee will come down. And so we need to be careful, at, especially at the city fringe, where the properties may have a risk of become vacant because the people and the companies want to move to the city centers, but they will uh, need uh, less space. Okay, good. Um, is there any other topics on that retail one? Because I've got had a question coming in. Thank you, Justin, for that on on logistics, um, which is, you know, in in terms of the German market, um, how do we see logistics at the moment? Um, and I guess, therefore, the extension of that is what's happening with online e-commerce. Um, you've obviously got the the route through China, as well, the route to China <coughs> coming through. What's what's the sense of uh, of the logistics market and the outlook for that, particularly in Germany? Um, look, if you look at um, demand levels, and you look at 
take up. You know, we're going from one record to, to another. Um, if you look at uh, supply, you can clearly see a supply response there. Um, the, the only problem is that in some of the most sought after regions, we're running a little bit out of land. And not every mayor is happy to um, you know, assign out a, uh, a new zoning plan for, for more logistics space because you know, it brings pollution and so on, despite the fact that it, you know, it brings uh, employment. So I think the main, the main thing here is you know, very high demand, um, uh, supply response, maybe a lack of um, suitable, suitable land, and that's sort of putting mild pressure on on um, uh, on rents. I think that's that's where I see it. I mean, if you look at the structure of demand, uh, I think you can see clearly the impact from um, online retail. There's more demand from from that side as well. But in a, for example, in a country like Germany, you know, which has a very big manufacturing base, you know, that demand is also coming from the traditional uh, manufacturers um, going forward. Okay, good. Does anybody else want to pick up that? I mean, Thomas, how are you seeing Germany within the context of, of Europe for the, from the logistics side? Of course, from a purely geographical approach, I think the middle of Europe is, might be one reason why we have so much gridlocks, and, and, and Russia was every day on the German Autobahn, by the way. But uh, speaking more, um, more, more rational, I think um, the, the evolution becoming, uh, demand is increasing from us due to Mr. Amazon, and we need to make more investments in, in, in logistics. It's a little bit too naive in my understanding, because there are might be a lot of uh, things we, we haven't discussed yet. We will have to discuss simple thing. In the last 10 years, we pay nothing for the person who brings us the, the boxes in our house. And now Mr. Amazon came up with Prime. They get it within 24 hours. What I expect and we expect, by the way, with these um, DHL and Amazons, some parts of the market, you and me, maybe we pay more than ever for the delivery service. And the rest will wait for four to five days. This will be the next step, which means you have a mass production, and you have that so-called last mile, whatever this means, by the way. And so, again, generally speaking, of course, I'm totally optimistic as an analyst for, for, for industrial, but the market separates so quick, last mile versus the big, fat schemes in the middle of nowhere with the employee machines, which are meanwhile gone in my understanding, and the resistance, especially get closer, closer to the edge of the cities. Nobody, to be honest, want to really have logistics. And this is, of course, a function we have to we have to look on the different uh, indications. What is right and what is wrong? Um, at the first time ever um, in my lifetime that uh, close to Berlin, um, there is a mayor. Well, there's a mayor who wanna wanna bring um, uh, Resi, a Resi uh, townhouse concept there. A logistic company, a famous one from UK. Um, go to him and say, I will pay you one euro more per square meter for our logistic schemes. And this is for me interesting because um, the battle between Resi versus logistic, same. Land side, and this is cool, positively speaking. So again, uh, it's it's hard to under, uh, to answer your question from a general approach. Next years we will see rocket up on all these uh, logistic numbers, but on the other hand, we have to face that uh, not a lot of people, mayors, and authorities really ask and run for these logistic uh, infrastructure and logistic properties. Okay. Yeah. Interestingly enough, you can also see that logistics companies look for very modern facilities now because what they want to bring in is automation. Because one of the big factors is obviously you know, the people there. So the more automation you can have, because let's not forget, logistics, it's a tough business. You know, it's a low margin business. So you know, when you say, Thomas, OK, you know, we might, we might uh, be prepared to pay more for delivery. At the moment, I have the feeling that a lot of logistics companies are really trying to win this battle by just you know, more automation. And this is driving demand for very modern warehouses. And if you, if you look at the specification of a warehouse, you know, 10 years ago and what it's going to be now and what's going to be in five years, it's a very, very different experience. You know, things like sustainability, things like charging point for electric vehicles, um, you know, there will be a uh, um, very high emphasis on um, sort of the connectivity of the building because there's going to be so much, you know, uh, devices speaking to each other and so on. So the, the warehouse of 10 years ago now in five years will, will look very different. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, I did. Um, I chaired a conference, one-day conference for P3 um, last week in Prague, um, which was looking at a lot of these forward things. Where particularly, also, the, the currently um, having workers is the biggest issue that everybody's facing. Is actually having people who work in these, I and mean, so people are actually building residential around where it is, um, and and automation is coming in very, very fast. Um, but at the moment, the, the main issue is 
uh, for, for space is, is wh where have you actually got a workforce? Did, did you want to pick up on that, Frank? Uh, briefly, yes. I mean, the, I was going to say that first, it's, it's really not a strategy for every investor logistics because the market is fundamentally controlled by, you know, Prologis, Logic Core, P3. That's, that's like the big guys. Um, and they have the Rolodex, they get the call if somebody needs space, they have access to land, they probably land bank a bunch of things. But technology does help. So uh, the sister fund to our little real estate fund, um, at EQT, has one investment company called Autostore. Um, and that is exactly you know, the robotization of a warehouse. So, so you're saving all of the common corridors because no human needs to pass through this corporate. All of the infrastructure is moved on top of the building. So you need something where you can build up a bit. And you have little robots that, that pick up, you know, like boxes, steered by a computer. And, and for, for some, obviously, it's a narrow, you know, set of problems that you can solve like this. But, but it will reduce the amount of space demand for warehouses again. You know, if you can save 25% of the footprint and, and the internal volume is optimized, you probably need a lot less space for those and then, and then the question is, what does that do to, to real estate values? You know, how much, obviously, the denser planned meters are worth more, but then the other meters that we're hoping for logistics use may not be worth anything because they will remain potato foods. So, so it's, um, it's kind of, it's following, you know, technology to the end that may be interesting in the future with, with regards to that question. Okay, good. Um, yeah. Maybe just a brief comment. I mean, you touch on workforce. What I think is also quite important to mention is like, which we didn't see on the slides, is that also construction prices over the last couple of years really increased. I mean, we see a thriving economy, and it's sometimes even difficult nowadays to get someone who builds a property for us. I mean, like, in, for example, in Berlin, you really struggle uh, to get good offers in, and even people showing up and, and doing the work. I mean, it's, I think it's also very important to mention it. Uh, that's across the board. That's not a logistic. Look at the office markets, and I think you know um, when you look at the German office markets, and you you, you know you ask about take up earlier. We've seen rocket uh, record volumes of of take up, and I think in some places it's actually hard to maintain these levels because we're running out of space. Now, if you look at a market like Stuttgart or Berlin, where vacancy rates are below three percent, you could even argue that's not even healthy for a city economy because you need space for companies to expand and, and companies to move. But again, if you look at the uh, um, construction pipeline, you know you do see it coming up now. But lots of the supply we're going to see over the next one or two years, you know, is already pre-let or, or taken up. So uh, even if you know we see a an increase in supply, I think you know we the vacancy rates will not shoot up at all, and that is quite quite interesting because you know it should give us a little bit more comfort about rents and rental growth. Just a little story. Uh, I was two weeks ago sitting in a train close to uh, next to an uh, Adidas manager. I don't want to advertise Adidas right now, <laughs> but um, we, we talked to each other and he told, he told me the story on these 3D printing uh, shoes from Herzog Auer. It was interesting with that. Prices between 250 euros and 450 euros. And then it comes to the logistic effect on that. I said, okay. And then we give the offer. Offer as Adidas, uh, you can. Get it via um, delivery via DHL or via limousine, which is private delivery. So what? I say it costs 50 to 100 euros more, uh, but you get it within uh, 10 hours. And I ask them, of course, the important question: Can you give me an indication what is the range of DHL versus delivery? What do you get? 100 shoes, 100 pairs of shoes. They sent out 30 percent. 30 percent were delivered with the private thing, which is about the day 500 euros per. Of shoes. Crazy story, but I think all the logistic discussion we follow is that it's more the, the analog world. We as demand drivers, I think we, we increase pressure dramatically on these what we call right now logistic big box in the middle of nowhere. Not everybody will pay these extremely high prices, but if it's that's that that one, then we see totally you a change of delivery. If you ask as an analyst on the Oxford Street, would you say, No, you're a crazy guy. Germany never would do that. But 10% really well, and this is the margin. And it does makes obviously really good, good uh, brokers on that. Okay, good. Um, uh, question just come in, which is, which I think is a good time to, to pick this topic up. I think, um, which is just in terms of sort of B, C locations. Um, what's the liquidity like? Um, and if you've got a, let's say you've got a five-year horizon, is now a good time? to be investing in those B and C locations or not? 
So any views on that? I'm sure it's not as straightforward as yes or no. There will be a nuance to that, but um, who wants to pick that up? Well, we, we think it's still a good time, to be honest, because okay. we're actually investing in those locations. Uh, well, why are we doing so? Um, the reason is what I just mentioned before. I mean, construction prices at the moment are on a very high level. So um, some of the buildings we're looking at, I mean, we buy them well, well below replacement cost. Um, so, I mean, this also limits supply to a certain extent. So we have very good occupancy rates in those locations. And as we all know, I mean, Germany is a very fragmented market. So a lot of the economy is within the regions. Um, people are looking for this sort of office space. I mean, it's not everything is like a very shiny place, like, like we're sitting in here, very beautiful office. But on the other hand, you pay like 10 euros on a square meter. And that's what a lot of those smaller uh, and mid-cap firms, what they're looking for. Uh, and in that sense, if you want to rebuild that at the moment, it's slightly impossible. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, for us as a house, for example, it all comes back to fundamentals, you know. Um, of course, you prefer the A locations for their liquidity, maturity, for the depths in the market. Um, but yeah, B, B locations are interesting if the, the fundamentals are right in terms of, you know, population growth, in terms of um, the general, um, configuration of the city, if you like, you know, if you have a strong university, if there is quality of life, you know, if there is uh, um, enough education and schooling and so on. So it really depends on on these kind of uh, more soft factors and if there is sort of um, a pool of, of, of skilled labor. And we have cities in Germany where, you know, um, the, the Mittelstand, so the sort of medium, small to medium um, enterprise sector is, is very strong. And these locations can be interesting for investment if you take a, uh, um, more of a long-term uh, approach, in, in my opinion. You probably get long leases, uh, you get low vacancy because there's hardly any speculative development or positive. Well, I think you mentioned at the beginning, you know, what happens when liquidity dries up or, you know, uh, you, it was you, you know, if you're if you in Solingen, you don't want to be in Solingen when liquidity dries up. But I'm, actually, I'm not, I'm not too concerned if, you know, um, we see lower levels of liquidity in a market like Leipzig or, or Dresden. Can agree, but unfortunately, we have this kind of especially whole bias anti effect in Germany. That's when, he, when it comes to these uh, former eastern part of Germany, uh, secondary locations like Erfurt, Jena, um, uh, Dresden, Leipzig, of course, uh, Rostock, uh, Magdeburg. I feel every time a little resistance talking to German, most of them are gentlemen, at the age of let's say 55 plus. Um, if the final dinner is taken, they say, Well, Thomas, we burned so much money there 20 years ago, and never again. And this is not rational in my understanding. Looking at the fundamentals, Thuringia, Saxonia, but also Grand Royal, by the way, you find when you're not in the outskirts of these countries, or these Bundesländer, um, you find attractive, undervalued, with a growth story in these things like Leipzig and Dresden. But again, the general mood is why the eastern part of Germany, you never know when it's so far, far away, close to Moscow, blah, 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 these things, um, which I don't like. It's, got, it's more, uh, it's more uh, it's a decision by, by gut feeling plus the evolution 25 years before and not by rational decisions. So I see more people from abroad, from UK, wherever, France, Belgium, who go more for effort and all these locations where Germans are a little bit resistant. Okay, that's interesting. Tim, Frank, do you want to pick that up? Yeah. We, we raised an, a regional cities fund two years ago and we've invested in cities like <coughs> Dresden, Freiburg and the aforementioned Augsburg. Um, that is a perfect strategy, or that at least was a perfect strategy. You had that chart, uh, chart with the yield gap between uh, prime cities and B cities, and I actually wonder whether it's still correct, because we experienced that the gap between A and B cities is, is getting closer again. And when you are then not careful um, when purchasing the properties, and they have um, a sustainable rent level to also invest into your property and um, have enough rent to cover your fit-out costs for new tenants, then it might be might be really dangerous, and that's why we wonder whether the cities of like like Magdeburg or so are really sustainable for an institutional investor. Because my personal opinion is that the the rent level there is not sustainable for institutional investors to maintain the building quality in in the long term, and and this so is, this is what I call the, risk. The, the rents are too low. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's so a, I mean the the basic logic that we. Kind of so far have applied in that regard is does it make sense as what it is where it is 
and how much does it cost to replace it? Is it like, are there barriers to entry for somebody else? Who probably, because you're in the outskirts, there is land. Um, does it make economic sense for somebody else to build something like it? You know, soonish, will you get the permit? So, so barriers of entry matter, um, and, and does it make sense as what it is, where it is matters, which is, you know, where do the resources of that company come from? Where do the employees live, and where do the clients kind of like reside? Um, and where the transport comes from? So, so that that's much more important. What you know, as a question to me, um, compared to is this in the big seven or not? You know, it, it's kind of like really does it make sense as the product that it is? And if you can explain that story coherently, and it's not too too big, or big enough then for sovereign wealth or something, uh, you will find a buyer as well on the institutional side. But you know, how many of these projects are there? I don't know. I mean, there's one cent to thousand, right? In terms of investable mega asset in Ubaos. Everything else is probably not so prime. So, <laughs> so it's, so it's, um, you always have to apply the correct logic for the correct assets. Well. Okay. We try to do that. So. I guess it's a, um, it's a story as well with investors from, you know, to explain to a German investor that Augsburg and Leipzig and, you know, uh, um, Hanover might be a good investment that's easier and to explain it to you know a foreign buyer, and foreign buyers account for what, 45 percent of transaction volume uh, at the moment, and and for them it is really about sort of the, um, the big seven. So it depends a little bit as well on where you're from, how good you know the markets. Okay, good. Um, I've got some other questions coming in at the moment, which are on um, growth of alternatives. So let's let's try and let's try and pick that up. Um, at the same time, let's also bring up residential because I'm quite keen to talk about that area. It's been a very big uh, growth area, particularly for Germany. Um, so let's pick up a little bit of residential, and then anybody who wants to pick up on the growth of alternatives, um, particularly student housing, micro living, those areas. Um, how sustainable, I suppose, is that in investment terms? Um, who, who wants to pick that up in terms of residential to start with? Well, I think if we start with alternatives, I would say, like, uh, if you look at student housing, uh, there's obviously a bit of a time gap between Germany, the UK, and where it all started, probably in the US. So it's coming over, and we saw large transactions over the last years uh, with GIC moving in into that market. But uh, I would say in the long term, it's just it comes a lot down where your where your asset is located. I think at the moment a lot of student housing players are in the market or building up portfolios, um, which in the very short term is probably quite easy because we're very high. Uh, student numbers in Germany and that's still not peaked yet uh, but I think in the long term a lot comes down to the product uh, have you got something which is unique to a certain extent is it nearly located to your university and so on and so forth so easy to fill up at the moment but probably in the long term maybe not as sustainable um, residential itself it's a it's a market we are very active in but primarily in Berlin um, which is a bit of our home turf uh, we, we like the market we still like it I mean prices are increasing as we all see uh, but still, still on a reasonable level. If you if you look at European capitals, uh, I think there's still there's still a, a good gap to be. Okay, good. The only thing to the to the alternative sort of residential strategy or, or general real estate strategy, the, the question that at least I ask myself is how much of the value is in the real estate, and how much of the value is in the services I provide, that may be outdated before long and hence not quite as real estatey as one would like to think for applying a yield to it. So, so, so to me, you know, concepts like WeWork is awesome, it looks beautiful, but you know, it's not even a tenant. This is, this is somebody who, you know, buys space wholesale and then sells it retail for a short du duration to people with no credit. So, so how good is that? It's, it's, it's something that we all, and it, the same goes for micro living, the same goes for student housing and so forth. They're all, they're all wholesale to retail strategies on the, on the take up side with cool concepts and, and very high relative rents. You know, student housing, you get whatever, 20 to 25 euros a square meter, normal, almost anywhere. Uh, if you go to Berlin or Frankfurt, it's get, it gets even higher, whereas the comparative residential rent will still be between five and 10. You know, what's the difference? Well, more kitchens, more shower rooms, and a concierge, and so forth. But, you know, that's replaceable. That is just, that's just fit out. So, so, so I, have, I have a bunch of hesitations when it gets to concepts like this. Okay, good. Um, Tim, let's, 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 I just want to pick up with Tim first, if I, if I can. 
because while we're on the alternative side as well, it'd be interesting to pick up on um, health care and those kinds of elements of, of alternative that um, Corbusier have particularly been working in for a long time. So what's, what's your thought on those? Um, is it, as Frank says, for, for those with more knowledge than others? What, what are the risks that you see? What are the opportunities? Well, first of all, I agree with you that there's a lot of operator risk on all these uh, concepts that includes healthcare as well. And we raised the first um, nursery home house um, fund uh, more than 10 years ago. It survived the financial crisis. Investors were quite happy. We launched the second uh, fund uh, five years ago. It's uh, now fully invested. Obviously, five years ago, it was a perfect time to um, kind of re-enter the market after the financial crisis. Um, it produces now 7% uh, seven, seven cash on cash, and IRR-wise, it's probably more higher than 15 and the investors in that fund are a super conservative insurance company. So they, they were aiming for a 6% return. So happy, happy bunch of people. But um, nevertheless, over the last five years, a lot of competition appeared. Um, regulation changes every, well, we, we think every two years now. It's, so you have to invest into the properties. You have to be very careful that you choose the right operators. Then sometimes the big operators, uh, most of them, private equity, um, when they appear in the press, you really get a problem with your, with your properties. Um, if they have proper pre, uh, prop, uh, press uh, covering, um, providing ne negative sentiment on how people are treated in those uh, nursing homes, you get, you get immediate issues on your entire portfolio with them. And so we kind of try to split the operator risk and we also do good locations because we, we think we need to be careful when we go into, uh, into the eastern province because you, you don't need, you need the old people to be in your place, but you also need the people who work for you. And um, if you're in the middle of nowhere, the problem is sometimes not to find the tenant, but to find the employees for the operator. So you need to be careful there. But still, it's a good investment uh, strategy. We, we launched a second fund, uh, medical office buildings, where I personally think that's um, probably the, the best product we, we have now because it's not fully institutional yet. There is a real yield gap between office buildings and medical office buildings. Um, and our opinion is that the tenants uh, stay longer and have a higher credit quality that, than most office tenants. That's quite good. The, the latest fund in the healthcare series is um, an assisted living fund, and, and there we face uh, the issue that we raised um, earlier, that uh, the yield gap between classical residential and assisted living or all the other micro-living concepts is, is closing quite rapidly. So we really have to ask ourselves whether there is additional value and the, the risk is priced incorrectly. Okay, good. Um, j just coming to you, um, Oli, <laughs> What's happening in terms of, uh, my understanding is that like you've got in the rest of Europe really, that there's increased migration, urbanization towards city centers. Is that happening across Germany or is that really focused on the seven big cities? What's happening? Yeah, interestingly enough, um, it, is, it is very, very focused. Um, you know, it's, uh, it is the big cities and it's southern Germany. That's the region that really see the highest growth in, uh, in, in population and uh, where people um, move to the cities, whereas you know large parts of eastern Germany and you know um, part really really struggle uh, in sort of like maintaining population levels, which is you know putting strain on on local governments. And uh, whereas you know the the growth of some cities puts puts strain on these cities as well in terms of you know the lack of available housing, um, congestion, uh, pollution, and so on. So yeah, but it is it is a it is a big topic in in Germany, and uh, it is happening. Um, not uniform, it's really sort of um, segregated into, into different corners. Um, good, interesting question coming in, which is based around that actually, which is, um, for anybody here, is if there's a lot of talk about micro-living and housing is therefore getting smaller, does that mean that that suggests there's a good opportunity for self-storage coming up in Germany? That's an interesting one, because um, I think there is a, there is a, a growing market for self self-storage in, um, in Germany, but other than in Anglo-Saxon countries or um, uh, some other European countries, usually houses in Germany, even the ones, you know, even like the larger uh, multifamily blocks, you always have storage, either in the attic or in the basement, um, which is 
which everybody, you know, you can always use it as part of your part of your lease. Whereas in a lot of countries, like uh, well, in the UK, for example, a lot of houses are built without a basement, um, and you just lack this kind of storage. But I guess the the growth story here is that you know people are getting more mobile. You know, um, you're not staying in in one job um, throughout your life. Uh, you're not staying in one city. Your company might move you around, and that is sort of increasing um, the demand for for that kind of product. I'm more bullish on the sector because it's sort of like you know, as housing gets denser, young families are back in trend. Whether they get married or not, they make babies. Um, and and when 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 you get to that point, you know, you you very fast you outgrow your the apartment that you just happily moved into with with all the extra baby stuff that you need to store somewhere. Um, just an example, but the same goes for the, the last meter kind of distribution. Forget the last mile. Um, you know, how, how, how do you set that up and how do you segue, you know, from, you know, solving somebody's home prom to somebody's delivery prom? I think storage concepts, whether that's a, that's a last mile pickup depot for an Amazon or a Lando or something, or whether that is self-storage next to, you know, big apartment blocks, say, it in, you know, I mean, our shopping centers in Grunau Leipzig, right? Tiny apartments in 14 to 16 story silos. No storage whatsoever. Young families move out, what do they do? So, so my example wasn't as, as sort of esoteric. It, it is a real problem that we need to solve in that neighborhood. And, and I think there are a bunch of concepts that may apply. Good, let's pick up on hotels. Anybody want to, to pick up on the hotel sector opportunities there? I take the hotel one. Okay. So. <laughs> So we have increasingly buy, have been increasingly buying hotels in, in Germany, albeit as a at a let's say limited limited pace, and we have been focusing on, on kind of four star business hotels, and so far we avoided any five star attraction, and we have also um, avoided the Motor One attraction because we think we are a bit too late. Um, in in the group we have more hotel expertise in France and we have um, investors investing with us in hotels so that is working quite well because it has a history and uh, we have a longer track record and the portfolios are a bit older and we have been um, benefiting from the, the yield shift so that is quite good and what is uh, maybe the, the most interesting thing is we have been um, investing in glamping sites recently in, in France yeah. Yeah, because we were we were looking for new niche sectors, and the portfolio is quite large. It's, it's 60 billion in total, and at some point you can start investing 100 million in some niche sectors to see how the profits are and whether it institutionally works. And this is something completely not institutional today. But um, if at least if I ask my friends, have you been ever to a glamping site? Most of them say. Uh, God, what are you asking me? But there are the first ones who tell me, yes, we have been there, and we liked it. I personally don't understand, but um, it, it seems to be the case, and the price tags attached to that, and the yields that we see, at least in the business plans, look quite attractive. Whether there is a market for that in 10 years, I completely don't know, but it, is, it might be a new niche asset class. Right, you're shaking your head there. Is that a personal distaste for, for anything under canvas? Or? <laughs> no, it's, it, I mean, this, it, the whole hotel question goes back to what I, what I sort of tried to say earlier. Is like how much of the value of this, uh, this building or whatever I'm supposed to buy as real estate is really in the real estate and how much is in the operation and the trendiness and the service level provision and the employee base and the EBITDA margins and stuff. And whenever you start talking about EBITDA margins that are kind of, you know, somewhere between 40 and 60% of a piece of real estate, clearly it's not real estate, it's something else. There may be a lot of real estate value in the various entry of somebody else doing the same thing in the same location or next door, but still, it's, it's something else. And you need to understand that that is something else. When you go to glamping, it's even worse, because it's, I mean, it's basically potato fields with a bunch of camping cars on it in a nice restaurant and a Starbucks. So, I'm sorry about the potato fields every time, but so, um, <laughs> So, so, so it's kind of like you know your alter alternative. Use them. You probably don't have planning for housing. You, you you will have an intermediary or intermediate use permit for putting a bunch of things there. They're not meant to be permanent structures. So, so, so to go and call that real estate is cool. It's 
You know, if, if it's under if it's under your LPA, it's cool. But it, I, I have my doubts. And we looked at a lot of the, the stuff here. You know, Park Dean and, and whatever those things were. The uh, the coastal uh, caravan parks in the UK. Um, Santa Parks obviously was a Blackstone investment, which worked really well. And we, we created VIP suites for people, and we put Starbucks in there, and and everything everything was nice. But is it real estate? I, yeah, I guess. But but it's not like the the solution to everything. We'll, uh, I, I, have a, yeah, I have a feeling that we're going to have to have a special glamping briefing uh, <laughs> coming up. Pan-European glamping, I think it's a good title. Um, just, just on, on um, the yields as well, if you, if you just you know, um, uh, buy the building or buy that hotel and you're really just sort of collecting a rent from the operator, your yields are actually quite low. And I think you know, that's where you, know, you don't have a, a lot of attraction. I mean, the fundamentals in Germany, I think, are good. You know, if you're in, in uh, popular locations, you know, the business cycle is strong, so you get business travel. Germany has always been a tourist destination, so you get, you know, tourists. So those kind of fundamentals are good. But if you just want to lease out uh, uh, that building to a hotel operator, your yield is actually quite low. Where the where the yield sits is when you actually get involved with the operating model and uh, you know uh, taking on operational risk. That's not for everyone, and I think you need to. You need to understand your sector. You need to understand how the sector works, how the location works. You know, you need to have a management skill um, to get that in. If you have that on board, then yeah, then I think hotels can be quite interesting because you get a higher yield. Is it then still real estate? Well, I guess yeah, you're right. You know, it's a lot about sort of how you run it. It's a lot about branding. It's a lot about uh, the services. On the other hand, you know, you should be. Um, skilled enough to choose the right location. As, an, as a real estate investor, you need to know which, also which, which locations work for hotels. Okay, good. Um, we're, we're running quite short on time, but I just want to pick up with you, um, if I can, Marius. Just, you mentioned that Berlin is a big favorite for you in terms of where, where you're looking increasingly um, a favorite for investors generally and not just for, for residential. Um, what's your sense of that? Um, do you see continued opportunities there? Um, is that a development play? Uh, is it a change of use play? What, what are you seeing? Um, yeah, I, I would say there's still there's a lot of attractiveness when it comes to Berlin. I mean, wherever you go, I mean, people start uh, start asking you questions about it. Um, on the residential side, we we still see very positive. As I said, prices are on the rise still. Um, but, but if you have an attractive entry level, um, what we are doing, for example, uh, we're buying existing buildings on the residential side, converting them, and then doing the, the classical sale of the apartments, which is a lot of work. Um, obviously, you're facing regulation uh, questions, uh, but at the same time, as I said, if you pick the building right, uh, if you have a, a decent business plan on it, and then you, you still manage to, to get attractive returns, um, there are buildings on the market, but competition is very high, uh, very high. Uh, at the same time, I mean, if you look at office sector, it's something we see positive as well. Um, but same same problem. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of competition going on when something is on the market. Um, but again, I mean, figures are, are very good. I mean, like in terms of net migration, so we talk 40 to 50 thousand people coming into Berlin year by year. So there's still a still a good growth path. Um, vacancy rates decreasing <coughs> over, over years now. Uh, residential side, as I said, I mean, we're talking about average prices of four and a half thousand euros a square meter. You go to the to the let's say fancier areas, or so we we reaching the tens uh, we, with some of the good apartments. So yeah, I think there's a still a, a good case. I mean, uh, demand is very high also on the on the on the single or end buyer side. I mean, we see people from all over Germany buying second homes in in Berlin because it's a cool city. And, and it obviously developed a lot over the last couple of years. Okay, good. Um, and one thing I just wanted to pick up some, some quick fire ones here. In terms of uh, the capital that you're seeing coming in, capital flows, are we still seeing new types of, new types of capital um, looking particularly at the German market? Germany and uh, the way it has developed in the last uh, 10 years and um, you know, the more international ex uh, international investors have explored, it has become uh, a more international market, and you see, you know, more capital flowing in from the likes of of Asia. You might not see it on the surface because often it comes via big managers, um, but there is um, Asian capital looking quite actively at opportunities. Obviously, that usually includes 
quite large transactions because if you venture out, you know, you need to make it worth your while and worth the work. If you need to convince your board back in Beijing or your board back in, in Seoul, then, you know, you don't want to do that for like a 30 million office building. You want to do that for 100 or 200 million uh, office building. But in terms of, of capital inflows, U.S. capital, I think, is, is still very strong um, uh, coming in. Um, also, on the other side, on, on selling out, so I think some private equity uh, buyers that, you know, snapped up um, uh, stuff five, six years ago have now, you know, worked through uh, those portfolios and are now putting stuff back on the markets. But if you talk to a lot of the agents and some of our transaction managers as well, there is a feeling as well that um, there's definitely an overhang of demand. Um, there is more people who want to allocate money into Germany than there is actually suitable product. That means we see a lot of competition for for certain assets, um, and that has obviously had the effect on yields, as I've already seen. And I have the feeling that this kind of weight of money is is not going away, even if we see a, a raise in interest rates. Um, my prediction here is that we're not going to see um, sort of a large uh, swing back into other uh, other asset classes, uh, bonds or equities or that we see sort of a massive uh, a swing in, in yields. I actually have the feeling with the weight of money being still high, with the economy sort of like nicely uh, tagging along, with employment highs and, you know, still the chance of, of rental growth, no overbuilding, no other leveraging, um, you know, the, the yields, even after an interest rate rise, will, will stay rather stable. And, you know, uh, the, the 5% we've, we've seen for, I don't know how long, which has always been our benchmark, I'm not sure if we're going to get back to that um, any anytime soon, Thomas. Fully agree. This is maybe the good old days. I have no idea, but I think it's also one thing which which we don't touch on that the money flow. Um, there was a promise by Mr. Trump, second buzzword today. He promised, and this is, sounds funny. It's not really funny. It's, it's operational. He promised in springtime next year the launch of the super trillion uh, infrastructure fund, which means if you build a bridge in Milwaukee. You're, you're invited to do that, get 8 or 9% total return back. So coming to that and saying that, um, and again, with or without Mr. Trump, um, this again where we expect heavily that there will be some money flow out of also from UK to the US. But today, it's uh, Oliver mentioned already, it's uh, US money to Germany, definitely. The French uh, running for um, mainly resi, then office or commercial, then just Berlin and Frankfurt. The Finns, Frankfurt. Um, Swedish, Danish, housing, Berlin, Hamburg. So it's, it's a cool, cool map. We, we make every month of that to see that, and, and a lot of um, from from UK, but also from the Netherlands or Belgium on the Ruhrgebiet, Roman Ruhrgebiet. So it's a mixed up. But again, don't forget that uh, I have my doubts of there's so much money. Asian capital will really uh, arrive in Germany due to the legal restructuring. People are vanishing sometimes, and then six months later they are back and become a teacher. Mm -hmm. Um, so I ha I'm not that convinced that it seems that uh, there is a flooding Asian money to Germany. Um, but we also should bear, bear in mind that there will be a, maybe a reaction from U.S. government uh, inviting investors to go there. And this could be also, a, I would say, um, let's say a strategy or a picture for springtime next year. Okay, good. Um, and I also wanted to just pick up with somebody. Um, <coughs> you mentioned it, uh, and obviously we've seen it here on the news about Merkel. Um, uh, how seriously do you think investors, outside investors, should take that, or is it really just going to be part of succession planning? It will go smoothly on because it's German. I think Thomas mentioned at the beginning as well. You know, does it really make a difference to the real estate markets? You know, does it really change uh, the German economy in its roots? Yeah, I mean, some of the reforms might be late. My concern is that. You know, if you see something disorderly happening, that is definitely not good for, for Europe as a whole. Um, because uh, with the things going on, populist governments, with, you know, Brexit going on, I think you need a uh, sort of someone who leads one of the biggest economies or the biggest economy of, of Europe, um, with, you know, with, with a safe pair of hands. What's going to happen? I think, yeah, it is actually succession planning. Um, and to be honest, you know, if, if the coalition holds um, till 2021, um, oh, after 16 years in government, it's actually not a bad idea maybe to have, you know, some, some, some fresh ideas. Let's see how, you know, the situation uh, unfolds. Um, the Social Democrats said, you know, um, they are rather stay in the coalition because that's what, a, what the people want as well. And to be honest, the way they're pooling at the moment 
you know, um, if we have general elections now, I'm not sure where the social democrats will end up. So for them, maybe staying in government is not a, not a bad choice. Um, but that's to be seen. And again, I think my point, just reiterating what what Thomas said at the beginning, um, I can't I can't see sort of Germany ending up in in turmoil. Um, just how the political landscape just always is. I think except the one thing, it's not the question of the colors and the right wing and left wing. I think all the parties will um, embrace the residential or housing sector in Germany more than ever, which means from a, from a top-down approach, I think uh, making investments in housing, generally speaking, becomes more unattractive due to rental break and all these things coming up. Definitely, whether it's the conservative or the, the right wing or left wing, no doubt, they will dig deeper in the housing market because the last rental break or the existing one was... Uh, not a guinea pig, it was nothing beside all the headlines. And this again, where I see a massive impact from political uh, decision makers in the housing sector, definitely. Okay, good. Let's start with you, Thomas, at that end. Um, last question from me, uh, which we always try to do just to, um, I'm hoping glamping's gonna come up again, personally, but we'll see. <laughs> um, what, uh, what does all of this mean in terms of investment, if you're thinking about the opportunities um, what kind of view does this lead you to in terms of, of opportunities that you see and you can choose whether that's short, medium, long term for Germany? Start with you, Thomas. Well, in the long term, of course, Berlin, the most undervalued market in, in Germany. Uh, second statement, of course, parking spaces. 88% of them are older than 30 years, which is the big for us as managers. <laughs> Um, plus the mobility change in that, but uh, again, I would always bring two thirds of my money into A locations and one third into secondary locations. That's it. Okay. All right. Good. Nice. Uh, I would stick with office. Uh, fully agree in Berlin, Frankfurt, maybe Hamburg in that order. If you go outside of these cities, I would say probably Leipzig is also quite an interesting town at the moment. And then, yeah, taking back to, to residential, uh, which I think, again, both major cities like Berlin, Frankfurt, they will definitely benefit over the last coming years. Okay, good. Yeah, I think it's, it's A locations and it's B locations where, you know, you have sort of similarities to A locations. Again, um, you might want to call it a, a winning city, you know, a deep pool of skilled labor, education, quality of life, good governance, these kind of cities. For me, um, I like office markets at the moment the most because, um, as I said, you know, you have um, an economy which is um, are still growing um, quite nicely, and you have very low levels of vacancy, and uh, it just seems you know um, the construction cycle is lagging still behind, um, which you know should give us some comfort on on rental growth. So, um, if you pick the right sub markets, you know I don't think CBD is probably you know for what we are trying to do, and the returns you're looking for CBD is probably not where you want to be. But there are interesting sub markets in a lot of the big German cities where you see some sort of change some maybe some infrastructure improvements or uh, you know some new resi schemes coming and um, areas which are all connected and I think you know there's an opportunity there um, in, in the office sector okay good Tim. yeah if there's an opportunity to invest I would go for for value add office opportunities and under invested under managed um, portfolios that work quite well over the last two years for us um, we believe still in, in healthcare that's a good asset class um, and uh, for our firm, with the history in house building, we are very certain that our house building land bank that we are still adding land to will be a great success also in the next five years. Okay, good. Frank? Difficult. Um, we, we always found, I mean, as what you just said, the, the undermanaged portfolios, whether that was Project Spring out of Goldman from the very last sort of throws of the cycle, but that's fully sold down now, the Mars portfolio, where we found some joy recently, last year, in, with, with Atra Company, Daivat, and, and an asset in Isenburg. But those portfolios are largely sold down. There's, I don't think there's much left. Maybe, maybe you disagree, but I don't, I don't think there's very much left. There's now a second line. So the, the shopping center in Leipzig that we bought was, was actually from somebody that bought it out of a distressed sale from somebody else. So, so you're going into the second inning now, uh, where the first guy you know, found joy in, in buying something out of distress and, and underwriting through the bankruptcy risk. And we're finding joy in making it better. And there's still enough margin. But, but going forward, I think it's, it's really hanging around the hoop and looking at people behaving unwisely. You know, not, not hedging interest because well, we've been 0% forever, so why, why should it change? Um, 
you know, if, if you see debt structures that, that have issues, that could be interesting for us uh, to work through. If you see business models that are just fundamentally in debt, so the shopping center problem that I talked about, where you no, know, there is no more tobacco stores, there's no more mobile phone stores competing for space in shopping centers, and fast fashion is reducing the amount of space these guys need. So how much space do you really need in a shopping center? So they all have a little bit of an over capacity under utilization problem. Uh, many times it's not bad, but, but that, sort of, that sort of question is what we're asking in the very micro. It's well enough. So we can that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.